Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here to talk to you about limits of sequences. If we have some sequence a sub n and the terms of that sequence get significantly close to some real number, by significantly close we mean as, as close as you can imagine and stay right there around that number, we'll call that number L. Um, as your terms get bigger and bigger, so we imagine after some point we're really, really close to some real number L, then we say that the sequence itself converges to that L, and we call that L the limit of the sequence. And if our sequence a sub n does not converge to a real number L, then we say that it diverges. So that may mean that it adds up to an infinite amount, that may mean that it just never settles down at one specific real number. Let's take a look at some examples here. Now you may recognize some of these as very familiar from if you've done like a Calculus 1 class doing limits with functions, and these are very similar. Uh, so limit of 1 over n, uh, hopefully we recognize that we have a constant over something that gets infinitely large. So as n gets really, really big, the whole fraction gets smaller and smaller. And so the limit here is going to be 0. Okay, so another way to say that would be to say that the sequence 1 over n converges to 0. Uh, if I go straight across here, I have limit of n squared plus 4n over n to the 4 plus 1. Now you may look at this and say it's indeterminate. We're going to cover that type of idea in our next video. But here if you're just using your knowledge from pre-calculus, maybe with rational functions, and you know that if you have a higher degree on the bottom than you do on the top, then you're going to basically have a horizontal asymptote if this were a function at 0 on the axis, right? So since we have a higher degree on the bottom than we do on top, without using any sort of rule like L'Hopital's rule, then we know that this limit is also zero. So we would say that this one also converges to zero. If we look down here in the bottom left, the limit of n cubed plus 2 over n squared plus 10n. So now this is a different story. We have a degree of polynomial on the top that's higher than the degree of the polynomial on the bottom. And so that means that this is going to grow more quickly than this. And that means that our limit is going to be infinite. And so we would say that this sequence diverges. It's going to get larger and larger as our term numbers get bigger and bigger. For this last one here on the page, uh, the limit of 2n cubed minus 1 over 5n cubed plus 3n. The idea here is that the highest power term in each polynomial is going to be the strongest term as n gets really big. So the 2n cubed is the most powerful term on top. The 5n cubed is the most powerful term on the bottom. Remember that when we have polynomials that are the same degree in the top and bottom for pre-calculus, then we just simply will find the horizontal asymptote, or in this case, the limit by comparing the lead coefficients. So the limit here is 2 fifths. For this one, we would say that 2n cubed minus 1 over 5n cubed plus 3n converges to 2 fifths. Some more examples here, we've got some exponentials. The limit of 1 half to the n. So remember if we repeatedly multiply by a number that is between negative 1 and 1, this is a geometric sequence and the ratio is a half. And remember that that will converge to 0. So this limit is 0. And if this is the formula for our sequence, we say it converges to 0. Limit of 7 over 6 to the n. So if we're repeatedly multiplying by something that is not between negative 1 and 1, that's a geometric sequence and this will get larger and larger as n gets bigger because the number is greater than 1. So the limit here would be infinite and we would say that this sequence diverges. If we look at the limit of e to the n, remember e is a very special number that's about 2.7 and some change. So since 2.7-ish is bigger than 1 and we're repeatedly multiplying by that, this is exponential growth. This is going to get bigger and bigger without bound. So this one also, the limit is infinity. We would say that this diverges. If we look at the next one, uh, limit of e to the negative n, this is what you would think of as exponential decay. Another way to think of this would be to say that this is the limit of 1 over e to the n. And so you get this exponential growth on the bottom of the fraction. We get an infinite amount on the bottom as we get larger and larger amounts of n. And so this limit would be 0, and we would say that this converges to 0. Here we have another case of what looks like an exponential. When I plug in an odd number for n, then I'll get a negative one. If I plug in an even number, then I'll get a positive one. So my terms actually 
don't grow and they don't really shrink. They just keep bouncing back and forth if I plot them, negative one, one, negative one, one, and the sign is changing but the value stays one. Um, you'll notice that it doesn't settle down at one because we're always jumping away from positive one and going down to negative one in between each of those. It doesn't settle down at negative one because we're always jumping back up to positive one and away from this value as well, so it never actually settles at either value. So this sequence would diverge, not because it grows to some infinite amount eventually, but because uh, it never actually settles at one specific real number. If we look at something that looks very similar, negative 1 to the n, but we put it over n this time, so we're still getting this sign change of negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1 on the top, but what's happening is the bottom is getting larger, so we don't just have a value of 1. We have negative and positive values that are swapping, but this dividing by n and n getting bigger means that we're going to be dividing by more and more stuff as n gets larger, and so we do have alternating positive and negative terms. We start at negative one, and then we get a half that's positive, and then we get a third that's negative, and we keep getting smaller values even though we're alternating back and forth. And you can see all of the positive values are definitely going toward the axis. All of the negative values are definitely going toward the axis. So because we're getting sort of this zipper kind of motion, you can see that all of the terms are getting really close to the axis. Of course that's a value of zero. So if we look at the limit of negative 1 to the n over n, our sequence here, this one converges to zero. So we get some similar patterns there with alternating sequences for both of these. One of them, the terms stay a bit apart so it does not converge, it diverges. This one, the terms collect together towards zero on both sides of zero. Some of our rules uh, for algebra of limits. So here I've just created a key up here. So assume in these examples that a sub n and b sub n are sequences and that their limits are a and b, just so you can keep uh, straight that the limit of a sub n is a and the limit of b sub n is b. C is just gonna be some constant here for our limit laws, our algebraic rules for limits. So the first one, if I just have the limit of a sequence and every term is the same number, in other words, it's a constant sequence, then of course the limit is going to be that number, right? So if we look at, this may be so simple, it's a bit weird to think about. So if you just have a sequence where all of the terms are one, what is the limit of that sequence? Well, of course we get really, really close to one as we keep going down the list because every term is one, right? So this certainly converges to one. If I had, you know, all terms in a sequence where every term was three, well, what are the terms getting really close to? Well, they're staying exactly three, right? Not even just getting close to three, but they are three forevermore. So this one's going to converge also to three. So if you have a limit of just some constant over and over, of course you're gonna converge to that number. So we'll write that down. We'll start a list over here on the right. Uh, this next law, if I have a limit of a constant times a sequence, um, that's the same as the constant times the limit of that sequence. That's the idea that you've probably seen from calculus, uh, from sums, from derivatives, maybe even some antiderivatives if you've done those, where when you have a constant multiple you can pull that out front. That's true with limits, it's true with sums, derivatives, antiderivatives, lots of things there. So all that's saying is we can pull the constant out front and evaluate without seeing the constant inside of the sequence. So an example of that would be something like the limit of 9 over n, all right? I have a 9 here. If I really think of this as 9 times 1 over n, then I can go ahead and pull a 9 out front and think of this as 9 times the limit of 1 over n, which we already decided, right? We already decided that the limit of 1 over n was going to be 0. So this is the same as 9 times 0. And of course we get a 0 limit there. Uh, another one, if I have 9 times 7 over 6 to the n, this was an exponential growth that we just did here. So thinking of it separately, pull the constant 9 out. 7 over 6 to the n is our actual sequence we're finding the limit of. We already said before that because this is geometric and my ratio is 7 over 6, which is bigger than 1, this is going to blow up infinitely large. So this one will diverge, right? The times 9, 9 times infinity, of course, we're still going to have an infinite amount of stuff there. The next few rules for limits are just saying that limits obey arithmetic. So if I have a limit of some sequence, 
uh, plus some other sequence or minus some other sequence, then we can just simply add or subtract those limits. This is the idea that if I have a bunch of terms and a limit that I'm trying to compute, I can just simply take the limit of each term separately, right? We do that with sums, limits, derivatives, antiderivatives. That's a nice thing that we can do with add and subtract. So if I have, you know, the limit of 6 plus 1 over n, I can just think of both of those separately. I can think of that as the limit of the first term plus the limit of the second term. Obviously, the limit of 6 is just going to be 6. The limit of 1 over n is just 0. So we get 6 plus 0, which means that this converges to 6. If we take 3 minus this rational expression here, n plus 1 over n plus 4, then you can think about, well, what's the limit of 3? And what's the limit of n plus 1 over n plus 4? Obviously, the limit of 3 is just going to be 3. That's where every term is 3. Here, think about these are the same degree. So this is an n to the 1, and this is an n to the 1. And if I compare coefficients here, 1n over 1n, I would get a limit of 1 there. So 3 minus 1 for our limit simplifies to 2. I'll also point out, without going through too much detail, we can also multiply. If I have multiplication between sequences and I'm trying to take a limit, then their limits are just multiplied. And also division, I guess we want to do a caveat here in that uh, obviously we don't want the terms on the bottom to be zero. We also don't want the limit on the bottom to be zero. So uh, limits will obey division as long as we don't have any zero in the denominator. One final thing that goes beyond maybe just add, subtract, multiply, divide, is if we have a function operation happening on a sequence that seems very straightforward. Okay, so if we have the limit of a function of a sequence, that's going to equal the function of the limit, okay? And that's going to be true if the function that's operating on the sequence is continuous at the limit. That seems a bit confusing. Let's explain that real quick, I think, just with an example. So the idea here, let's say I have the limit of square root of 4 plus 1 over n cubed. If I just had 4 plus 1 over n cubed, we could do this just term-wise. We would say the limit of 4 plus the limit of 1 over n cubed. But now we have the square root. It's like a function, right, that is happening to what we already know how to do. I look at the inside of this and I say, well, the limit of 4 would be 4. And the limit of 1 over n cubed would be 0, because the bottom blows up really big, and 4 plus 0 would be 4. So the question is, is the square root function continuous at 4? Is the square root function well behaved at what you would think of as x equals 4 usually, right? And of course it is, right? We could take the square root of 4, no problem. We know how to do that with the basics of square roots. So we think of this as the square root of the limit of this thing. Of course, we know that this is going to be 4, so that's going to give us square root 4, and then we can just evaluate like we would with normal function operations, and the square root of 4 is 2. Okay, hopefully that gives you an idea of how limits of sequences behave similarly to what you might have done with functions and maybe some of your other calculus studies already. We've got another video coming up when limits get a little bit trickier. We'll see you in the next video.